Hello and welcome to the Craft Beer Corner. For today's beer review, we are moving back over to Europe. Uh, reviewing a couple different beers, um, not even the same style from two different brewers. Um, but the common theme is that they are lighter. I don't mean in aroma or flavor, I mean lighter in color. Um, the first, we're gonna come back and uh, revisit Kronbacher. We've done several of their beers. Uh, today we are gonna review their Pilsner. Uh, this one's 4.8% ABV. Uh, they are based out of Kronbach, Germany. Uh, the second beer we are going to review is Leffa's Blonde Abbey Ale. This is a Belgian Golden Abbey Ale, 6.6% ABV, and they are based out of Dinant, Belgium. Though, as a sidebar, this is actually brewed in Leuven uh, by NV InBev, which is the European arm of uh, AB, Inve AB InBev, uh, Anheuser-Busch, you know them, uh, the parent company. Um, Kronbach, uh, Kronbacher founded in 1803, uh, Leffa founded in 1240. Uh, so two, uh, you know, spread by you know, greater than a half of a millennium of time between them, uh, but two older by modern standards, American standards for sure, uh, brewers, uh, one Pilsner, one Belgian Golden Abbey Ale, and uh, we're going to jump right in, starting with the Kronbacher Pilsner. All right, jumping into our first beer of today's uh, lighter European beer review. We're going to Kronbacher's Pils. This is a Pilsner, of course. 4.8% ABV, um, based out of Kronbach, Germany, founded in 1803. Um, now, if you've watched many of my videos, then you know that I absolutely love Pilsners. In particular, German and Czech Pilsners, where the style is born. Um, they are quite a bit different than your average American Pilsner in that a traditional European Pilsner is actually rather hop-centric. Um, yes, there's a nice malt that can run the gamut as sweet to kind of grainy, but uh, one trait they have in common is they are a lot more hop-forward than their American counterparts. And that's one of the traits I love about them. They're light and refreshing, but they still have this nice hot bite. Mind you, not on the level of an IPA, and they're not designed to be, but they are far more hop forward than your average American Pilsner. So let's jump in. We've already done a few Krumbacher beers, uh, both of which were fantastic. Let's jump in today and see what their Pilsner is all about. Already pouring this in, this is a classic Pilsner appearance, a very light, Straw, kind of hay colored, light, light yellow, formed a nice, nice head as you expect from a Pilsner. Now this is not on a tap, so it's not stupid, stupid creamy. There's a good mix of small, medium, and large bubbles in there, and it's very, very effervescent. And this is just a beautifully clear beer. It's uh, beautiful to behold in the glass. Maybe the camera's picking up all of that uh, carbonation activity, but it's, it's just lovely, it's streaming very, very rapid champagne-like bubbles, very small champagne-like bubbles. Let's uh, see if I can sniff it through this head. Absolutely can. This has a very pronounced aroma and it smells like a classic German Pilsner. It's got this slight sweetness to it that underlies just this beautiful grainy malt base and you can smell the hops right up on the aroma. Um, they're not shy about putting hops forward in this beer style, and that's how it was brewed historically and by design. Uh, we have just um, kind of sullied this beer style's reputation in that the big box mass market American breweries in existence today um, modeled their big box mass market beer off of the German and Czech style Pilsners. But bearing in mind, uh, Adolf Busch, and uh, all of the other German immigrants that came over and founded breweries several hundred years ago in America, when they first made their beers, they were not anything like they are today. They were big, bold, flavorful, you know, full of quality ingredients as they came from Europe. It's just been slowly been watered down and watered down and adding in adjuncts and cost cutting to the point where they're unrecognizable from what the original beers were. And it's uh, really quite a shame because I am sure that they were fantastic several hundred years ago. And today, uh, I mean, they're just not, they're not quality beer. I don't mean they're not quality beer. I just mean for the money, for what I'm getting out of it, no thanks. 
I actually like to smell my beer. I actually like to taste my beer. I want to be able to dig deep into all of the ingredients and feel the love and experience it in my glass. And you can't get that with big box, you know, mass market nonsense. And you know, and it, it is a shame. But nonetheless, let's jump back to where it was born and see what Krumbacher has to offer in terms of their Pilsner. Mm. That's a very nice Pilsner. It's very light, very crisp, very enjoyable. Okay. This is not as hop forward as many German and Czech uh, Pilsners are, um, but it's exceptionally well balanced. It's still got an underlying little bitter there, but uh, doesn't blow you out of the water like, say, a Bitburger Pils does. Uh, that's a very hop forward Pils indeed, and many others I've reviewed recently. This is not like that. This, the name of the game on this is balance. You get this nice, bright, almost honey-like sweetness in the front and you taste absolutely a beautiful mouthful of that grain bill and it's absolutely delicious and it pairs so well with this honey sweetness and then you get just this subtle underlying bitters. Um, the grains and the sweetness really are the dominant flavors in this profile. And then the hops are kind of underlying that. It's um, maybe about 10% of the total flavor profile. They're there, you still get that slight hint of a hop bite, but it's not as present as it is in many, many other of the uh, German and Czech offerings that are in the market. It's a very nice beer. I'm gonna jump in again for body and mouthfeel and explore how this finish develops. body for a 4.8 Pilsner is actually medium. It's got a nice uh, medium robust body to it for a Pilsner. It's quite robust. Um, the mouthfeel, very, very smooth. Um, it's not creamy. It's not super dry and it's not overtly effervescent in the mouth and it's not ridiculously viscous. It's somewhere hovering in the middle of all four of those ranges. So it's kind of a hodgepodge. Um, the finish, develops exactly like I called it on first taste. It's sweetness first, then grain, then the underlying hops in the back. And it's very even throughout the distribution and how it develops and how it finishes off. Um, the dryness that you get comes through a lot more pronounced on the finish than anything. It's not dry, it's not brutish, but it's not a wet, moist finish like with many, many beers. It's got a little drier edge to it. Um, it's very nice. The finish also plays out pretty long. Um, it's not as long as some Pilsners, but it's certainly longer than average. It, it lets you continue to taste that mix of sweetness and malt and hops. And it's just super clean and crisp and refreshing. And that's a hallmark of the style. That's what a Pilsner should be. Clean and crisp and refreshing. It's one of my de facto hot summer day beers. And it's just got so much to offer in this style. It, it often gets looked down upon and, um, you know, give a quality Pilsner a chance. If you haven't done so, get your hands on some German brewed and Czech brewed Pilsners. I promise you, they are nothing like their American counterparts. And that's the highest praise that uh, I can bestow upon them. Uh, caveat, I don't mean American craft Pilsners. They're brewing even bigger and bolder uh, examples of the classic German and Czech styles that are fantastic, equally as good. Some that actually I think, you know, for my personal preferences, I like more. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely we're trying this Kronbacher Pils. This is, a, this is a very nice, lighter, refreshing Pilsner and I absolutely love it. I'm gonna take my time sipping on this, come up with the scores, and then when we come back, we will move on to Leffa's Blonde Belgian Golden Abbey Ale at 6.6% ABV. Okay, now for our second beer of today's uh, lighter side of uh, European beers. Uh, we are jumping over to Leffa's uh, Blonde. This is a Belgian Golden Abbey Ale. 6.6% um, ABV. Uh, as I stated prior, uh, Leffe is based out of Dinant, Belgium, uh, though it is brewed in the city of Leuven uh, by Envy InBev, which is AB InBev's uh, European arm. Uh, Leffe was founded in 1240, so it's a very, very old uh, Trappist brewery. Um, 
you see abbey or trappist, that means monastery. It's monastic monks brew. Um, and this is one of the handful in the world. I think it's, I think it's 13. I know for a fact it's somewhere between 10 and 15, but I think it's 13 existing uh, abbey beer producing, you know, trappist monasteries. Um, okay, so there's a little confusion before I get jumping into the beer. Uh, you may have heard this beer pronounced lef or lefa or lefe. There are two correct pronunciations, uh, lefa, uh, which follows the Dutch pronunciation, which is very, very closely related to German, and uh, Lef, which is the French pronunciation. Um, quick little history on geography and regions and language of Belgium. Uh, if you're not familiar with the country of Belgium where it's located on a map of Europe, Belgium is directly south of the Netherlands. It's directly north of France, and it's directly west of Germany. And it's a very, very small little country land-wise. Uh, it just sits right between all three. And the region and countries by which it's situated, uh, geographically speaking, have a profound impact on its culture and its language and identity. Um, there are three distinct regions in Belgium. Uh, essentially, the northern region uh, that borders the Netherlands uh, speaks Dutch predominantly. Um, there's one exception, and that is the city of Brussels, which is in the northern region, uh, which also is the area of uh, Belgium that's called Flanders. Uh, they sometimes call the language Flemish. Um, both are correct. It's Flemish or Dutch. It's the same language that they speak there. In Brussels, which is situated, it's its own entity, but is situated in the uh, Flanders region, they speak both Dutch and French. Uh, the region just south of Flanders is uh, Wallonia. That's the second largest region of Belgium. They speak French there. It's also the region that borders most closely to France. And then the third most prominent language that's spoken in Belgium is German. And it's in a couple, comparative to the size of the country, it's a couple very small little areas. It's on the very eastern edge of Belgium uh, that borders Germany. That's where they speak German. Uh, that is Eastern Wallonia, uh, which uh, Wallonia is that kind of central area um, where French is the most dominant spoken language. There's a few other dialects. There's Limburgish, Luxembourgish, a few others, but those are the main. So Dutch, French, and German are the three primary languages that are spoken in Belgium, and it really is based on geography, what other major country they border. That's how it got broken down into that. So, Leffe or Lef, really your choice, though uh, I prefer Leffe, as that is how the brewer pronounces it as well. They use the Dutch or Flemish pronunciation. Nonetheless, uh, bottle art, nothing really to talk home about. European brewers tend to uh, be very uh, understated, especially the older brewers. They, they keep with tradition. Their, la their labels have remained uh, fairly consistent for a long time, so it's, it's really a, a history piece looking at their labels. Uh, let's get this poured right in the glass. All right, this is quite effervescent, so I don't want this head to get out of control. So I'm gonna be pretty gentle as I finish pouring this. It's already got a very nice creamy head formed. Just want to be really gentle to get the last bit of this in here. All right, all things considered, I think that was a pretty good job. And that is a very creamy, very thick, rich, creamy head indeed. Uh, holding this up to the light, this is a stunningly beautiful beer. It is crystal clear and a beautiful golden blonde color, um, exactly as the name implies, uh, Leffe Blonde. And uh, it's a Belgian golden Abbey Ale. So I, I think that the description is fitting. Um, don't know if the camera is picking that up, but it is very, very, very effervescent indeed. Very fast, very tight, tiny moving bubbles. I'm gonna jump in and give it a sniff here. Oh, that smells so nice. That smells so nice. This smells like a typical Abbey Ale. Um, and there's actually a quality about it that reminds me 
of hefebites in yeast, though I am certain that it has not been brewed with hefebites in yeast. Uh, I'll have to do my research. I'm nearly certain it hasn't been brewed with hefebites in yeast because uh, it would certainly alter the style, um, but it smells very nice. It smells like a classic Trappist. You get a lot of sweetness, a lot of malt, and just this slight hint of what the beer flavor might impart. I expect it's gonna be sweet and it's going to be malty, but it's gonna be uh, heavier and bigger than your average kind of similar European style. The Abbey Ales tend to have a bit more substance to them. They also tend to be higher ABV, 6.6. Uh, .6, that's certainly a really reasonably high ABV just for a blonde ale. Um, it's not a golden strong ale, golden Belgian strong ale or Abbey Ale, but it's not far off the mark. It's, it's only an ABV or two below the uh, lower uh, threshold range. Um, nonetheless, I am just gonna agitate this beautifully creamy head. It's almost a crime to break this down because it formed so absolutely beautifully, but I wanna be able to jump into this beer sooner than later without diving through a massive, massive foamy head. That's also gonna help uh, bring up some more aroma here, so. Yeah, yeah, all the classic hallmarks you expect from a uh, Belgian Trappist Dale really come through on the nose and I tell you, it's really throwing me for a loop here because a lot of this aroma really, really does remind me of a classic Hefeweizen. There is this slightly clovey undertone to it, and I don't actually expect to pick that up in the flavor profile at all, but it smells very nice on the aroma and how it mixes with the malts and, and that sweetness that comes through. Um, this head is just so thick and lush and creamy, and that's not a bad thing. It's gorgeous. It, it formed and is holding beautifully, but... We're just gonna have to dive through it to, to sip in. That's a very nice beer. That's a very nice beer. And I am pleasantly surprised and pleased to say that my nose was not deceiving me at all. Whether or not this has Hefeweizen yeast or some other wild Belgian yeast strain that has Hefeweizen yeast characteristics, I can absolutely confirm that what I was smelling with that clovey kind of back comes through in this beer. This tastes like a stronger, bigger Hefeweizen uh, mixed with a standard Belgian Trappist blonde ale. I mean, it really does. It smells like a hybrid beer. It smells so good and it tastes so good. I'm gonna jump in for another sip here. Body mouthfeel finish. The body is medium. The mouthfeel is quite creamy. Um, it's not super viscous, but it does have some thickness to it. Um, not in terms of say a really thick um, New England IPA or an Imperial Stout or Porter, not quite on that end, but it's uh, thicker than the average uh, Belgian Trappist Ale to be certain. It's got some thickness and it's got some weight. How this flavor profile develops, when you first get it in your mouth, there's this honey-like sweetness and, and that is the best way I can describe it. It's, it's honey-like in the way that it presents itself. It's a sweeter, denser, um, richer sweetness that comes through and that immediately opens up into this beautiful malt bill that sits behind it and then that clove just bursts forth. There is an abundance of, of clove presence in this flavor profile that really comes through strongly in this beer. This, is, this tastes to me like an amped up, hyped up hybrid of a standard Belgian Abbey Ale blonde and a German Hefeweizen. It, it smells like an amalgam of the two beer styles and it tastes like an amalgam of the two beer styles. This is very, very enjoyable and this to me is unique in the beer world. I'm not sure I've ever had a Belgian Abbey Ale that tasted like this and it's very, very pleasurable. And this is a bigger beer too. I'm going to jump in one more sip. so nice. It's so nice. It has such substance. And the finish, 
as all of the peaks of how all of those flavors develop and intermingle, and then when it finally comes down and starts the right out to the end, it's clove on top, malt behind it, and honey sweetness on the bottom. So kind of the order of operations and intensity flip-flops once it hits its apex and its downward trajectory to the finish. And I can tell you, it's got a pretty stinking long finish. I can still taste intensely that clove and that malt and that honey sweetness still. And it's in really beautifully balanced all the way out to the end. And that clove just is really making itself known. It's such a powerful flavor. Um, it, it just sticks with you. This is such a great beer. I absolutely love it. Um, in fact, all the years I've been drinking beer, I've seen this beer a hundred times. If I've had it, maybe I had it once and it would have been pushing 20 years ago. Um, so to get in and to be able to really break this beer down, which is a very, very well-known beer indeed, it's been around a long time, is a real treat for me. I absolutely love this. I'm gonna pick it, be picking up more of these because uh, this is just so stinking enjoyable. I'm gonna take my time, sip on this, come up with my scores, and when we come back, we will get both beers ranked top to bottom. Okay, now that we've gotten to enjoy both of these uh, delicious beers, we're going to go through, get them ratings, uh, starting with the Kronbacher Pils. This is a Pilsner, of course, 4.8% ABV uh, out of Kronbach, Germany. Uh, starting with the aroma. This had a classic German Pilsner aroma. Um, it was certainly above average in, in how readily you could detect it, but it wasn't as pungent as uh, the highest end of the spectrum. Uh, still well above average, it gets a seven. Uh, for the taste, I really, really enjoyed this. Uh, this beer was really all about balance for me. Um, balance of everything, uh, including in the aroma, al although it wasn't super pungent, but had all of the classic German Pilsner traits. You get that slight honey sweetness, you get that beautiful malty base back, and this uh, nicely hop forward character that's so atypical compared to its American counterparts. I really enjoyed it. I would have liked a little more hot presence, but still it was fantastic. I gave it a nine. Um, for the body, this had a very, very good body for a Pilsner to be certain. It had nice substance and it was a really good example of the style, um, just shy of perfection. I gave it a nine. Uh, mouthfeel, it was creamy, it was smooth, it was effervescent, and a slight dryness to it, which is rather typical for the style. It um, Really, if it just had a little bit more thickness to it, at a 4.8, um, it, it was a little flat compared to the uh, top, top end, but I still gave it a very, very high score again. I gave it a nine for the mouthfeel. Uh, for the finish, this beer had a very, very long finish. Uh, it certainly did. And it was a wonderful balance and evenly distributed across the entire ride of the finish. You got that nice sweetness, that nice malt, and that nice hop characteristic. Um, and it lasted quite a long time. I gave it a nine for the finish. A head and retention. This poured a beautifully creamy head that had massive staying power. And I always appreciate it when it's not on draft. I'm just pouring it home and it forms a head as it should. Uh, this nailed it. It gets a perfect 10 out of 10. Uh, for the appearance. This was textbook Pilsner. Uh, it doesn't get any better than that. It gets another 10 out of 10. Uh, balance. This was a very well-balanced beer, and I said this uh, a minute ago. The story of this beer is all about balance. Really, the only knock that I have on it for German Pilsner, I did expect it to have a little more bitter edge to it, a little more hop, focus, and presence, um, but it was still exceptional. I gave it a nine. A feeling in the intangible, I also gave it a nine and it's for the same reason, just a little more hops. I would have kicked it up to a 10, but this was an exceptionally well done German Pilsner. Uh, finally, as an example of the style, score here mimics the, the prior two and it's for the same reason. It gets a nine, just a little more hop forward presence and it would, would have gotten that perfect 10, but still an absolutely excellent example of a German Pilsner. Uh, total score on the Kronbacher Pils is a 90 out of 100. This is well, well above average, well worth seeking. If you're a fan of Pilsners and German Pilsners, uh, definitely can recommend giving this one a try. Uh, moving on to beer number two, this is the Leffe. This is the Blonde Belgian Golden Abiel, 6.6% .6 out of Dinant, Belgium. 
Um, the aroma on this was very, very nice. It was uh, much more present than your average uh, beer indeed, and certainly on the higher end of the range for a Belgian Abbey Ale. Um, it was quite present. I gave it an eight out of 10. Uh, for the taste, this was just fantastic. It was everything you expect from an Abbey Ale and everything that I could detect in the aroma came through in the flavor profile. It, it nailed it. I give it a perfect 10 out of 10. Uh, the body on this one. The body was certainly much larger than your average, just standard Belgian Golden Abbey Ale. 6.6% uh, .6 ABV, it has a good bit of fermentables in it. I actually expected it to be a bit more robust than it was, but still well above average. It gets an eight. Uh, mouthfeel on this one. Mouthfeel on this, again, was super, super smooth. It had a little bit of effervescence and, and it was rather creamy just due to how tight and fine the bubbles form. That's usually an indication you're gonna get a nice creamy texture. Also had some viscosity. I would have liked a little more from a 6.6 uh, ABV, but uh, it only missed the part mark by one point for me. I gave it a nine out of 10. Uh, for the finish, this was a very, very long finish indeed. It just kept going and going and going. A beautiful balance to that honey sweetness, that wonderful Abiel malt back and that clove quality that I absolutely didn't expect until I sniffed it and then my taste confirmed it. This was fantastic. I absolutely loved it and that finish was so long. I gave it a 10 out of 10. Uh, head retention, just like with the Kronbacher pills, this poured absolutely beautifully. It was a wonderful, creamy, thick, dense head. And even when I broke it down, it just didn't want to. It had such retention, it was beautiful. Perfect 10 out of 10 uh, for the appearance. This was textbook Belgian Golden Abbey Ale. Nothing more to say, perfect 10 out of 10. A uh, balance. Just like with the Kronbacher, this was another story of beautiful balance in a beer. Everything that goes into this beer style came through including that unique twist with that clovey bite. And I don't know what yeast strain they used. I'm assuming it's some wild Belgian strain that is similar to a classic German Hefeweizen yeast strain, uh, but I loved it. it. It was just so well balanced through and through. Perfect 10 out of 10. Uh, feeling and intangible, I loved it. Um, it's a 10 out of 10. I, I mean, I have nothing more to say. I was so pleasantly surprised with this beer. It's a fantastic offering. Uh, finally, as an example of the style, there are many, many Abbey Ales out there. Even though there's not that many monastic brewers, there's plenty of offerings. They have multiple different beers across those that brew, uh, probably 100 plus. Uh, this is a fine, fine example of a Belgian Golden Abbey Ale and it had a, a quite unique twist with that intense clove nature. Um, I absolutely loved it. I think it's a great example. It gets a perfect 10 out of 10. That brings the final score on the Leffa Blonde uh, Belgian Golden Abbey Ale to a 95 out of 100. So both of these beers ranking very, very high on uh, the rating scale indeed. I absolutely re recommend both of them. Completely different beer drinking experiences. Absolutely different, to totally polar opposites, but both fantastic. I really enjoyed doing this review and I hope you learned something and I uh, hope you at least found it uh, enjoyable and uh, informative. As always folks, thank you so much for tuning in. I sincerely do appreciate it. Um, you know the drill, like, comment, subscribe. Comments are big, uh, they're really, really big. Please uh, let me know in the comments on the videos your thoughts, opinions, feelings, questions, suggestions. Uh, just let me know. I, I am here and I am actively listening and awaiting your commentary. Um, if you want to keep in the loop when our videos go live, you can click the notification bell. It's the little bell icon right next to the subscribe button. Until next time, folks, keep your beer, keep your craft. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers. Cheers.